Hey everyone, God bless you and thanks for tuning in. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing a few thoughts with you about a fantastic book that I just read. But before I do, I'd like to introduce some new PNP merch. I don't know if you've seen that we have uh, come out with our merch store. Finally, we've opened our merch store. It's been a long time coming. I'm wearing one of the fine Patristic Nectar hats, but you can find all sorts of uh, fantastic hoodies and t-shirts and bags, uh, notebooks, all sorts of great stuff. If you want to find out, you can just go to our website and click on merch. You'll see it on the top of the site. It's also around the front screen. Hope you enjoy it and uh, we'll promote our labors. I also hope that you've seen that uh, our latest volume of the Sermons of St. Philaret of Moscow, the Russian Chrysostom, who reposed in the Lord in the 19th century, 1867. Our first volume was dedicated to the spiritual life. This uh, is a collection of sermons, uh, 26 sermons on the subject of the great feasts of the Lord. So if you want uh, this great saint's exposition of the significance of our Savior's incarnation, there are multiple homilies, for instance, on the nativity here. Uh, if you want to see the significance of the cross, of the plundering of hell, of his resurrection from the dead, of what the ascension means for the salvation of man and the day of Pentecost. Great material and a great Christmas gift. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or just by clicking on our website. Okay, dokie. Today I'd like to speak with you about uh, a text that I just finished reading. Uh, it's a book entitled The Dying Citizen, The Dying Citizen, and it's written by one of my favorite authors, Victor Davis Hansen, VDH for short. Dr. Hansen is uh, a longtime Californian. It's one of the reasons I love him. He's a, a humble farmer uh, from Central California, the breadbasket of the world. He is also a classicist. He taught the classics for many years at Cal State Fresno. Uh, he's currently uh, an ind independent fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. He's the author of many books. He has a tremendous competence in uh, ancient Greek and Latin and in the classics. He also has a, a specialty in history and particularly military history. For years, I taught a class uh, here uh, in our town at uh, one of our local universities here, dedicated to the history of California. And I used uh, one of his books on the history of California, which I thought was precious. This volume, The Dying Citizen, is uh, a profound, uh, dense, but witty um, commentary on the value of citizenship, and especially in the incredible threat to American citizenship that uh, we're experiencing right now in the United States. Uh, if you're not an American and you're watching this, it doesn't mean it doesn't apply to you. Uh, of course, most of his commentary will be about specifically the, the Constitutional Republic that we know as the United States, the longest standing constitution ever in the history of mankind. Uh, but his the principles uh, that he will articulate in this volume about citizenship and what it means uh, is uh, precious and important no matter where you live. You know, we believers uh, take citizenship extremely seriously. We take most seriously our heavenly citizenship. St. Paul writes to the Philippians, for instance, that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But that same apostle, St. Paul, also appealed to his Roman citizenship and its value in his public ministry. He uh, was conscious of having a dual citizenship. They aren't equal citizenships. Our heavenly ecclesial citizenship is primary, and it informs the way that we live in our earthly nations. Uh, but earthly citizenship is also precious, and Christians have always found it of great import. The entire book is divided into two sections. It has a fantastic uh, introduction, an extensive introduction, and also a very nice epilogue but I'm going to address just the, the six chapters that constitute the main Oh, ooh, here we go again. Find me. Let's turn off. Well, my tech guys are going to get me for that. 
<laughs> I have no idea how that worked, especially since my airplane mode's on, but I'm not very intelligent about this tech stuff. So, oh well. The center of the central portion of the book, the fundamental portion of the book is de dedicated into two parts, what he calls pre-citizens and then what he calls post-citizens, pre-citizens and, and post-citizens. The pre-citizen section is divided into three chapters. Those chapters are peasants, residents, and tribes. And I'd like to talk to you first about those chapters. I think you'll find the uh, material to be extremely relevant to understanding our current circumstances. In the chapter on peasants, uh, Dr. Hansen describes the tragedy of the extreme decline of the middle class in United States society. He explains, going all the way back to Aristotle, who spoke a lot about the value of the middle class and what the middle class brings to the stability of a society and how important the middle class is in order to protect from authoritarianism and tyranny. Unfortunately, we see uh, the middle class declining radically in a way it never has in the history of the United States. In fact, he suggests that what we see developing, uh, and he's writing especially from a context of the state of California, with the presumption that if progressive policies that have been enacted in California continue throughout the nation, that we'll see this uh, increasing throughout the United States. He points out that we, what we see is the, is the rise of a new um, peasant class, a new uh, serfdom taking place in the United States. And he gives us lots of details about that. For instance, he points out to the extreme decline in property ownership uh, in the last 10 years, the fact that it's becoming uh, virtually impossible to buy a house in many states, especially uh, here in the state of California, that it's the lowest uh, across the nation, the lowest percentage of property ownership in 50 years, that 58% of Americans have less than $1,000 in their savings, that there's been an incredible increase of gov on government dependency. 46% of Americans are dying with, with less than $10,000 to their names, meaning that they're leaving virtually no inheritance to their children. He, he adds also a, a section about the incredible explosion of student debt uh, and the whole concept of dependency that's being foisted and the decline in value of uh, college degrees and how this is killing the existence of the autonomous uh, citizen. He especially highlights the role of California in this uh, growing peasantry. Uh, he points out that we have uh, the highest poverty rates, the highest taxes, the largest number of people on welfare. In fact, about 40% of the entire nation's welfare recipients are in California now. We have almost half of the nation's homeless, we have the steepest uh, gas uh, and electricity prices. We have the largest number of illegal aliens. And we have the greatest amount of out migrants, people who are actually leaving the state. Uh, and the worst uh, at the very, very bottom, 48, 49, 50 of the uh, worst schools uh, and roads in the nation. And then he points out, of course, that we were the first nation to lock down. Those realities, the decline of the middle class, the, la the loss of the autonomous citizen, uh, the rising oligarchy that is dictating California life uh, translates, practically speaking, into a very authoritarian approach uh, to uh, the last uh, 20 months of our national crisis with the pandemic. The, we were the first nation, the first the state in the nation to lock down. Uh, we destroyed uh, one third of all small businesses in the state of California and created the greatest amount of all the 50 states of a government dependency and gave more money away than anybody. That's his chapter on peasants, extremely fascinating chapter. His second chapter is dedicated to the subject of residents. And here he is comparing the difference between a resident and a citizen and how that, di that differentiation, which has always been traditional in America and has always been expressive of the value of the content of citizenship, uh, that, that it was something that was cherished and that had certain rights and privileges associated with it and presumed uh, certain commitments and responsibilities. Because those the, the citizenship has been declining and uh, has been dumbed down to resident status, there's very few differences now between residents and citizens. He points out that traditional citizenship 
in America has been colorblind, uh, but not value blind. Citizenship, in fact, was a, a common commitment and embrace of certain cultural values, uh, certain political values with regards to freedom, certain political philosophies with regards to the role of government uh, and the importance of religion. Unfortunately, uh, that the emphasis on distinctive colors has become important and the content of uh, Americanism has declined. He points out, in fact, that there are very few differences that remain between citizens and residents. In fact, he points out just a few. There's the right to hold office, the right to have a U.S. passport, the right to vote. And then he points out that all three of those areas the only remaining differences between a citizen and a resident are also being attacked and being questioned uh, by many. He also points out in, in a, an amazing era, this amazing era of cute computer records where they seem to be able to uh, keep records of everybody, especially as, as they're trying to collect health, what has previously been private health information, uh, as the government has been trying to collect and has efficiently been doing that, records on the vaccinated. They still don't seem to be able to tell us how many illegal immigrants there are in the United States. A fascinating uh, uh, lacuna there in their technological accounting, <laughs> he points out. Um, the third chapter, which he entitled Tribes, uh, he, he launches into that chapter with a beautiful explanation of uh, the first kind of uh, effort uh, to uh, hold a, a wide swath of uh, cultures and uh, languages and ethnicities and colors together. Uh, he it was in Rome, and he points out that we owe, in fact, the, the word natio, that from which we get nation, we owe it to the Romans who created the concept of a nation that was uh, colorblind uh, but value-laden. And that, that principle is what has been between us. And that the more that you emphasize your tribe, uh, the less you, you are able to fashion uh, a nation that will be able to contain a multiplicity of tribes. He pitched against each other the concept of multiculturalism versus traditional American multiracialism. Multiculturalism uh, is an attempt to say that all cultures um, are equal regardless of their values. This is how it expresses itself, uh, which means that the American culture, so to speak, Americanism, the content of citizenship um, is not a value and not something that you should focus on. Uh, this is the idea that's being that has been promoted and it has been destroying the sense of unity or nationhood in the United States. He points out, he starts by expounding on some uh, ancient Greek historians, Herodotus, Thucydides, etc., who gave commentary on tribalism and called it pre-civilizational. Even the ancient pagan Greeks knew that when you have, when you lose your concept of civilizational commonality and you emphasize your tribe, you are in fact on a path to destroy your civilization, which he argues is exactly what's happening now. And he points out a few things as we, as we change our self-identification in America to be a matter of our race and our gender instead of our, na our nationhood, as we lose our common sense of citizenship and its value. He points out that uh, we see all sorts, the return of all sorts of, of racism. We, we see secular universities all over the country literally building housing, student housing that's segregated, holding graduation ceremonies that are segregated holding orientations that are segregated. Uh, it's this horrible rise of uh, the tribe in the decline of citizenship. So that's, that's the first half um, of the text, which he uh, is focusing on pre-citizens. The second half is absolutely just as fascinating. He, he calls that section post-citizenship, and he divides that also into three sections, the unelected, the evolutionaries, and the globalist, the unelected, the evolutionaries, and the globalist. The section on uh, being unelected is his commentary on the tragedy um, of the growth of the administrative state. Here he uh, it makes an attempt to point out the attack on citizenship by creating a government, allowing government uh, institutions that are not based on the Constitution, 
uh, allowing federal bureaucracies to grow uh, to such a degree uh, that now the connection between the citizenship and their representatives is being seriously threatened and fractured. The more federal bureaucracies grow, the farther they are from accountability to citizens themselves. And he points out that the growth of the administrative state is grotesquely unconstitutional and is an enemy of freedom. And haven't we seen that uh, in these last 20 months as all sorts of people that we didn't even know, most Americans had no idea existed, like public health officers, could literally take away from us the most precious things in our life. They could tell us that we couldn't be with our families when they're dying. Uh, they could tell priests where they could and could not go. They could tell people that they could and could not uh, leave their house, could not have families over for dinner, could not go to church. Uh, and all of this radical compromise of basic constitutional freedoms, all by people we hardly knew existed before, if we knew that they existed at all. We see the uh, appearance of unhistorical, unprecedented, 20-month-long uh, declarations of emergency to allow governors to uh, exercise purely authoritarian powers without even the consult of their state legislatures. And he explains that this is the, the fruit of uh, the growth of 450 federal agencies, 2.7 million bureaucrats, a federal register that now is constituted of 175,496 pages, 235 different volumes. <laughs> and he points out that uh, this is uh, the true deep state, that, that modern usage of the word deep state is in fact uh, just that, a modern usage. There's a much older usage that spans the growth of the federal bureaucracy, the unconstitutional growth of the federal bureaucracy uh, since the time of Woodrow Wilson and onward. It's a fascinating chapter. And of course, he, he deals a little bit with uh, the CIA and the FBI as, as well, since they have such uh, an important part in this whole concept of the unelected. Um, the whole concept of government of the people, by the people, and for the people that are representatives from president to uh, congressman and senator accountable to the people, that that fundamental commitment, reality of American citizenship and government has been terribly uh, fractured due to the unelected status of uh, this bureaucracy. The fifth chapter he entitles Evolutionaries, and that is not a reference to Darwin and his origin of species and the growth of Darwinian evolution theory. It's a, it's a commentary upon how um, those who are promoting this uh, uh, erasure of traditional American citizenship view the Constitution. They, they, they want the Constitution to evolve, and by that they mean they want it not to apply. <laughs> They want to find ways in which uh, it can become a wax nose and not uh, uh, become effective in limited government, for instance, or the separation of powers. The United States Constitution, of course, was created to protect people, to protect personal property, freedom, individual liberty from government and the mob. This is why we have a constitution, and it's done a better job than any constitution in the history of the world, and is, in fact, the longest standing constitution in the history of mankind. And yet many who are uh, behind this redefinition or eradication of traditional concepts of citizenship uh, want the constitution to evolve right out of existence. Uh, he explains how the widespread abuse of so-called executive orders from the presidency or from governors uh, has worked to override the Constitution, how the uh, eruption of, of illegitimate emergency powers exercised by chief executives in states, uh, the aggressive attack by progressive elites against the Electoral College uh, and the Senate, which are very important aspects of political philosophy in the United States Constitution that are designed to protect uh, the citizenry from uh, the vicissitudes of uh, pure democracy, which we know from history has often led to the instability of states and complete destruction of their integrity. And he uh, has a beautiful chapter, Evolutionaries, on that. His last sixth chapter he calls Globalists. So it's unelected evolutionaries and globalists. These are the post-citizens. And he points out simply that what many 
of our patriarchs have pointed out for the last 20 years as globalization has uh, enwrapped the world. And that is that the more you emphasize global concerns, the more that you uh, attend to global concerns at the expense of national concerns, the more you lead to the evisceration of liberty and prosperity in your own nation. Um, the more that you widen the definition of citizenship and claim to be the citizen of a world, of the world, which is uh, completely irrational, there is no such thing as world citizenship. Uh, the more that you do that, of course, you denude your own real citizenship uh, in your country. You, you eviscerate its content and you really turn over authority. Uh, the, the, the fruit of globalization is that you turn over authority to a few million unelected global elites, uh, the Davos man, so to speak, who are going to uh, orchestrate the developments of your country and what, whether or not you have um, prosperity and freedom. And of course, that may seem okay, especially if you're from a country that has never known freedom and that you've gone from one despot to another, then maybe this collective could be a little improvement. But if you're from the United States of America or from other representative democracies where you are used to freedom, then this uh, new supposed globalized norm under the uh, oligarchy of these rich elites, these experts, so to speak, uh, is often a tremendous uh, step down, so to speak, and a step into uh, forms of slavery, what, an, what a traditional American would consider a form of slavery. What does all this mean and why would I recommend this book? It's a fantastic book uh, for anyone to be able to have a grid through which to understand many of the developments that have taken place, especially in the last years here in the West, and particularly in the United States. And also it's a, it's a clear recipe, an evaluation and a recipe for the renewal of citizenship. You know, uh, to use a parallel between the state and the church, the more that, uh, that believers, the more that, that Orthodox Christians take seriously their uh, dignities, and responsibilities as members of the body of Christ, the healthier the church is. On the earthly parallel, in the political sphere, in the national sphere, the more that uh, individual citizens take their responsibilities and the value of their citizenship and freedom seriously, the healthier the country will be. This has been a time, these 20 months, of tremendous spiritual renewal for many churches as the pandemic has shaken many people out of their secular lethargy they face death, and the gospel has become more precious to them. It also can be a time of uh, national renewal. When we see the atrocious consequences that have appeared in the last 20 months, unspeakable um, uh, authoritarian, tyrannical actions that have deeply compromised our way of life, we never dreamed that this could happen. We always thought that we would be protected from such things. But in fact, we have a tremendous opportunity right now to renew our commitments, our value-laden commitments to true citizenship, and to invest ourselves in building, once again, renewing our foundations of freedom. And may that be blessed by God. Thanks a lot, and I hope you uh, might get yourself a copy of The Dying Citizen and be edified. God be with you. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present a four-part lecture series by Father Josiah Trenum entitled Male and Female, Reflections on Transgenderism. These lectures directly address this latest iteration of the sexual revolution and the sexual anarchy unleashed by a cultural rejection of the Christian theological foundations of creation, anthropology, sexuality, and the traditional therapeutic paths of the church. These lectures explain why Christians cannot reasonably avoid studying transgender ideology in today's cultural climate, how this new worldview on sexuality finds itself deficient in explaining and healing our fallen human condition, and how love must compel believers to open their arms to persons seeking God from a transgendered background. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.